Um, welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are really honored to have our Grand Round speaker today. Our Grand Round speaker is a well-renowned radiology leader internationally, Dr. Jim Rawson. Dr. Jim Rawson is the Vice Chair of Operations and Special Projects in Radiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Rawson is also the Secretary Treasurer of Board of Chancellors of the American College of Radiology. Dr. Rawson has had held multiple leadership positions throughout his career. Uh, Dr. Rawson is the former Chair of Radiology at the Medical College of Georgia and Chief of the Division of Health Policy at the Georgia Regents University. Uh, he was also the Vice Chair of he, uh, He's the Vice Chair of Operations at the IDMC right now, and was also the head of the Center for Outcomes Research and, um, uh, and Improvement. Uh, Dr. Rawson is an abdominal radiologist and uh, was the chair of the ACR Budgets and Finance Committee uh, and the head of the ACR Commission on Patient and Family-Centered Care. Um, he has given numerous talks on very important topics, and this is a very important topic, which is tools to improve value in radiology uh, and the healthcare. I personally met Dr. Rawson at RSMA, and I was immediately struck by his immense knowledge um, in, uh, in, multiple, in multiple specialities in radiology, and, and also that uh, he was such a nice human being in spite of being so famous. So, uh, and we have tried to arrange this talk for some time. And I'm really glad that Dr. Rawson, in spite of his busy schedule, would take out time today to, uh, to give this talk for us and to share his pearls of wisdom. So thank you, Dr. Rawson, uh, for doing this for us. And you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, what I'd, I'd like to do in the time we have together is to talk about some different tools we can use to improve value in, in radiology and in, in healthcare in general. So what I want to do is really give you a, a, a different perspective to look at uh, healthcare. So if you look at this glass, most people would see it as either half full or half empty. If it's half full, you would be considered an optimist. And if it's half empty, you'd be considered a pessimist. But what I want you to realize is that there's many different ways to view this. And it's the tools that we bring to a problem or a challenge that often help us. So I'd like to help you think about this glass a little differently. So if a physicist looked at this, they would actually say that the glass has always been full it is filled half with wine and half with air, and the glass is not half empty. An engineer might look at this glass and say that it's poorly designed. If you were a lean or a process improvement thinker, but you would look at the glass and say that it's twice as large as it needs to be, and that it has waste built into its design. And if you actually were a wine connoisseur, you would complain that I had put red wine in a white wine glass. But all of those would be different perspectives on the same object that we are all viewing. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about the data that we might be able to collect in healthcare. And we're gonna talk about how we can interpret that and what types of tools would be available to do that. When you talk about quality improvement in healthcare, you'll very quickly run across the seven tools. And the seven tools come from uh, Ishikawa, who wrote a book called Guide to Quality Control. And his intent was to democratize statistics so that the average person could use these tools to analyze and to interpret data. And he argued that 90% of the problems could be solved with just these basic tools. So if we look at these tools, uh, and this is a, a list of the seven tools, cause and effect diagram, check sheets, control charts, and then the histogram, Pareto, and scatter charts, 
The seventh tool is a little bit more controversial in that there are, are different candidates for it depending whose list of seven tools you look at. So stratification, run charts, or flow charts are all proposed as, as the seventh tool. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you some examples and illustrations of how we might use these tools in radiology. But what I want you to realize is while the list is seven tools, uh, quality improvement has a lot more tools than seven. So if you find yourself looking at a problem and one of these tools doesn't fit the problem very well, then there's an opportunity to explore some of the many other tools that we can use for process improvement. We, and we are going to start with data and how you get data. Uh, in bus the business literature, you'll often hear people say, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And different management gurus are assigned or uh, having said that particular quote and, and attributed that insight to them. But that, that quote is actually a paraphrase uh, from the gentleman pictured here. Uh, this is Lord Kelvin of the Kelvin temperature scale. And this is his full quote. When you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So if we're going to improve things in healthcare, we're going to have to get some data and some numbers so that we have an understanding of what we're trying to improve and how we can improve it. So often when you tell people they're going to have to get data, um, there's either resistance or a sense of, of um, inadequacy or uh, helplessness. And, and part of that is because we don't all have uniform access to data and different types of data. So one of the things you'll often hear is someone say, I can't do pro process improvement because I don't have access to the data. Or if you work in a health system that has an electronic medical record, you may feel that you can only get access to the data by having someone create an IT uh, management report, pulling the data out for you. Or if you're a trainee, you may feel you don't have the authority to get the data. Uh, or in, in an era where people talk about data analysts having special skills or data scientists having special analytic skills, you may feel you don't have those skills. And again, this is why I think Shikawa's approach is, is so appealing. He's trying to democratize data interpretation with a, with a handful of, of commonly used and accessible tools. I do wanna give you an illustration though of just how powerful basic tools can be. This is a map of a portion of London from 1854 that Dr. John Snow had uh, used. And what he did over a hundred years ago is he was able to, during a, a cholera pandemic, take the home addresses of the people who died and actually put a mark on the map of London for their home address. And I'll, and I'll blow this up a little bit for you. And what you can see is there are a lot of these little black marks clustered around Broad Street and even more so clustered around the pump that was on Broad Street. And this was how he was able to localize the source of the, the cholera infection down to a, a, a pump, a water pump that the community used on Broad Street. And as you get further from that Broad Street pump, the number of cases of cholera decreased and eventually fell off to almost zero. So if this can be done with paper and pencil, I think we should be encouraged that we can use very simple tools to have very powerful impacts. One of the, the tools is called a check sheet. And if you look across the top, it just lists the days of the week. And then the individual rows are labeled with types of problems that might occur. And the simple hash marks with the fifth bar being put on obliquely so you can count batches of five, this is a way to collect data manually, but in a very simple process. 
I'm going to use for, for to this talk, I'm going to use some sample data. I, this is fictitious data that I've just made up uh, to illustrate the, the points of how to use these tools. But this would be a, a table uh, of data that we might get in a radiology department. And just like the last table, it has the days of the week running across the top and the different types of problems or defects that occurred uh, down, running down the side. And this sample data is going to be looking at delays in the CT scan start time for patients. And this is the, the first thing to think about with the data is there are different ways to handle data. We want to think about the differences between what tools we might need to collect data, what tools we might use to analyze the data, and then ultimately what tools we might use to try and visualize the data. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about data visualization. I'll just suggest that you look at uh, Edward Tufte's work. He's a Yale statistician who's done a lot of nice work on how data can be presented in very effective ways. But we're going to focus on once you've collected the data, uh, how do you analyze that data? How do, you, how do you work with the data? And the first tool we're going to look at is just a histogram. And a histogram is a type of graphic representation. It shows a distribution. And there'll be a range that's divided into small intervals. So if we took that delays in CT scan start time, we put it into a histogram, it would look something like this. And what you'd see is the days of the week and the number of delays per day. And the first thing that you probably all notice is that the number of delays are not the same every day. On the high end, Tuesday and Friday are much higher than Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And Sunday and Saturday are much lower than any other day, and they're actually zero. And from this data, you, you are probably prompted to start to ask questions and think about the data differently. You might ask, what's different about Sunday and Saturday? Do we not do CT on Sunday and Saturday? Or you might ask, is this an outpatient imaging center that's closed and doesn't do any scans on Saturday? This might make you think about the data and whether you collected all patients, outpatients, or inpatients. If this is a hospital and it's running seven days a week, but there are no delays on CT on Sunday or Saturday, you might ask yourself what they're doing differently on those shifts from the rest of the week. Do they have a different process or a different way of scheduling patients on those days? Or you might look at the Tuesday and Friday and you might ask about the environment you're in and ask what's different about those days. Are those the days there are larger clinics? Are those the days that there are uh, more add-on cases? What's different about those days? And this gives you some insights and the ability to explore your environment and your data in a very targeted way. But we can take that same data sheet that I showed you and we can use another tool. We could look at uh, a bar graph where we're just looking at the counts of events or problems. So now, rather than looking at days of the week, we're now looking at the specific causes of the delays. And what we see is that in our sample data, transport is the biggest cause of delays. And some of the other numbers are actually quite small and even zero. This is very helpful in getting a sense of the distribution of causes. But there's another way to take this bar graph another step further, and that's to use a Pareto chart. The Pareto principle uh, is the 80-20 rule, and it says that about 80% of your problems are going to be explained by 20% of your causes. And the purpose of a Pareto chart is really to highlight the most significant factors in what could be a very long list of, of factors. 
And this is based on uh, an Italian economist named Pareto who looked at the distribution of, of wealth uh, amongst the population. And, his, and this was his 80-20 rule. So this is a, a Pareto chart, again, using the exact same data. And the way I want to look at this is on the left-hand side is actually what you might call the, the raw number, numbers. And this is the actual number of events related to each of these causes. But on the right-hand side is the percentage of causes. So we still have those bar graphs, but they're now ordered from the highest value to the lowest value. And there's the addition of this line. And what the line is doing is it travels across the graph. It is, it, is, it is accumulating all of the data. So as you start at transport, 58% of the cases are due to transport. When it picks up the emergency data, data cases, those are additional delays due to emergencies. That brings it to 78%. And what that's telling us is that between transport and emergencies, that accounts for almost 80% of our delays. Now, most of us can't schedule our emergencies. They're usually unpredictable and they arrive, at they arrive when they arrive. So you're not gonna be able to improve your CT start time by changing emergencies, but you might look at the next two factors, which would be lab and radiologists in, in this in the sample data and waiting on labs or waiting for a radiologist to protocol a case, that actually uh, adds a few more percentage points. And if you were to deal with transport labs and radiologists, you would actually be close to 80% of the causes of your delays. So if you wanted to focus an intervention, these would be areas that were very worthwhile to focus an intervention to try and reduce the number of delays and start time in CT. Where this gets really interesting is if you look at the other end of the graph, the RN or nursing, the CT tech, equipment failure, or even pharmacists, those aren't causing any significant delay. That means if our improvement project focused on what the pharmacist did, we would probably have no impact on delays in CT start time. We could even look at the IV starts, but if, if we're waiting on IVs for such a small amount of time, no matter how much we improve that, we won't have a significant improvement on our CT start times. So I find this tool very helpful because it lets us use the data to focus where our interventions could be most impactful. So most people, when they see a Pareto chart, are a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of data that's in there and what it might take to make these. And so I often hear people say that they don't have really good graphing skills or they wouldn't even know how to make a Pareto chart. And I, I would tell you that's okay, because if you have access to a web browser, uh, you probably could do a web search for free templates and name your, you know, one of the uh, improvement tools that we're talking about today. And you probably would find templates for those tools online that you could down download and use. So let's keep moving through this and let's talk about, uh, let's talk about processes. Now a process is a series of steps or ap actions. And I like to think about them as occurring in a specific order and to obtain a specific end or a specific outcome. So let's say in preparing for this lecture, I determined a topic or a scope for the lecture. I looked up material, I prepared slides and I rehearsed it. And finally, I'm, I'm giving the presentation now. How different do you think the outcome would be if I changed the order of those steps? What if I looked up some material and then I rehearsed, then I put some slides together and I gave the presentation and at the end of the presentation this morning, I decided what my topic was and what the scope was that I wanted to cover. 
the outcome of the and the effectiveness and impact of the presentation probably would be very different. Edward Deming said that if you draw a flow chart for whatever you do, that until you do that, you do not know what you're doing, you just have a job. And what he was trying to say is that if we can document and detail out the steps of what we're doing, then there is an advantage as to how we're putting that together and we have an understanding of that. So let's look a little deeper into processes. Not only does order matter, but the number of steps matter. If you have a 10 step process and at each step you do it right 90% of the time, and the other 10% of the time you make some mistakes, those mistakes are propagated to the next step and the next step. And ultimately at the end of 10 steps, even if every step was done correctly 90% of the time, your outcome is, is not 90%. Your outcome is gonna be about 35% of the product or the, the task done correctly. If you reduce the number of steps, you can dramatically improve your outcome. And in processes that are more complicated or even working at a higher rate of correct number, cor uh, correct uh, performance at each step, you can see that the number of steps makes a difference. A 10 step process that's 99% done correctly at each step, when you propagate that through, at the end, you're gonna have you know, 90% done correctly and 10% mistakes. If that process had 20 steps, you can see that that will drop down to about 80% done correctly with 20% errors. This is where a flowchart can help you. Um, there are a flowchart just is gonna be a graphic representation of the process. It should provide you enough details to understand the distinct steps, the sequence, the interconnections or dependencies, and we use standard symbols uh, to, real, to convey these functions. If you make a flowchart of what you're doing today, as Deming suggested, you would be flowcharting your current state. If you were trying to do a process improvement project and you were going to change a process, you could change that current state flowchart to be the process with new steps. And that would be a diagram or a flowchart of your future state as things would be in the future with your intervention. And this is a way of conveying to people what the new workflow would be or what the change would be. In a fairly simple flow chart, if we go through the logic of this, you start at the top where it says the lamp doesn't work. Well, if the lamp doesn't work, you go to a decision node that says, is the lamp plugged in? If the answer is no, and you go to the next step, which says plug in the lamp. If it's yes, then you never go down that branch that's no, you go to the branch that says yes, and you say, is the bulb burnt out? If yes, you replace the bulb. If no, you keep going to the next step, which says repair the lamp. And this may not be the way you approach repairing a lamp, and you may want to add steps about power supply or type of lamp or room or the amount of light. You may have other variables you want to include, but this is a way to organize the process and the analysis that you're doing, trying to get, trying to address a lamp that's not working. Uh, this flowchart looks at just putting a stamp on a, uh, a letter to mail it. And again, takes some of these standard uh, symbols where you can see the ovals at the beginning, at the, at the top and at the bottom for start and stop. The diamonds are gonna be your decision nodes where you have to make a, a, a decision. And then you have multiple steps uh, in between. And you can see that we start, we go through the saying, let's uh, address an envelope, fold a letter, place the letter in the envelope, and then do we have a stamp? If you don't have a stamp, you borrow one. If you do have a stamp, you place the stamp on the envelope and then that can be placed into the mailbox. These can get more complicated. Um, I won't ask you to try and go through all of the steps on this, but these are some of the steps involved in making a purchase on an online service like uh, Amazon. 
But part of the power behind doing this is having some common language and common symbols. So the oval is a start and end, a square is an activity or a step, a diamond as a decision point. And then again, notice the arrow, which gives you a direction of the process because the order in the process does make a difference. Another way to look at a process would be with a control chart. Uh, Donald uh, Wheeler talks about control charts as being the voice of the process. And he tells us that the voice of the process is talking to us through the control chart. And, it, and he asks you whether you're really listening to the process when you look at the data. If you're interested in learning more about control charts, uh, he has some nice books on the topic, Understanding Variation and 20 Things You Need to Know. Uh, but I'm going to go through some of the concepts of variation and control charts with you now. So first we talk about two different causes of variation or two different types of variation. Uh, one is common cause variation. And you think about that as sort of the noise in the system. This is the random cause, the natural problems that occur in any process. It's just an inherent part of the process. Uh, this is often considered ongoing and predictable. And if you were to look at this in a control chart, uh, you're often going to be uh, uh, three standard deviations from the mean uh, to look, I'm sorry, you're going to be within three standard deviations uh, to talk about common cause. When you move to special cause, this is not the background noise. This is where there's some specific change, some unique event. This is more sporadic. And this is where we try and assign the, a cause for that specific fluctuation in the data. It's unanticipated. We usually can't predict this. And these type of events tend to be beyond control limits, but they also can be points within control limits that have a pattern uh, that we'll talk about. Um, not quite random, but out of that randomness, we can detect a pattern that that suggests that we're, we have something else going on, some special cause variation. So if we look at a, a control chart, which you'll often see is a, a series of uh, numbers down the bottom. These could represent days or hours or, or, or other, some other unit of time. And then there's a measurement and, it's, uh, and a, a mean or average has been calculated and that's your, your solid center line. And then we have uh, labels for one, two, and three sigma as our upper control limits or UCL and our lower control limits, LCL. And when the data is, is plotted on here, you can see it rises and falls and oscillates around the mean or the center line. And what we're gonna do is use a control chart to look for some patterns uh, where, we may, where we may say that there's more than random uh, uh, background noise going on, and we have to investigate to see what, what special cause is occurring. So on each of these four uh, graphs, uh, each of these four control charts, they're illustrating uh, some of the rules uh, that can exist in control charts. So probably the easiest one to realize is when you have a data point that is more than three sigma uh, from the center line, either above the upper control limit or below the lower control limit. And the, uh, in that first graph, you have a red dot that's um, above the control limit and you have one down the bottom that is below the control limit. And so that would suggest that there is something going on more than uh, common cause variation and you would want to investigate. But there's a, rule, there's a rule of twos where you have two of three consecutive points uh, that actually fall beyond two sigma on the same side of the center line. So even though it doesn't exceed that three sigma upper control limit, having two consecutive points out of three on the same side um, above the two sigma line, that's a concern that there's special very, some special event going on. If you go to the next one on the bottom where it says rule three, this, uh, this is four out of five consecutive points falling beyond one sigma, again, on the same side of the center line. And the last of these is nine or more consecutive uh, points 
uh, falling on the same side of the center line. Again, raising concern for uh, a special cause variation. So there are different sets of rules. There are Nelson rules and Western Electric rules, and I've included links to Wikipedia that has nice articles uh, describing these if you want to learn more about these. But most, for most of us, um, we don't know all the ro rules of control charts, and we probably don't know how to build one incorporating all of those rules. But again, I would suggest if you uh, look on the web, you'll probably be able to find some Excel templates or other uh, tools that are control charts that actually have uh, several of these rules already built into them. And as you put your data into these control charts, they will flag the outlier data that raises concerns and needs to be investigated. And this sort of brings us to the um, what happens when you have found a special cause event, how you might investigate it, and what types of tools you could use for that. And I'm going to use this as the time to talk about root cause analysis. And under that uh, title, I'll introduce a couple of other different tools. In a root cause analysis, what you're really looking for is system failures that, that really cause the problem. And uh, we believe that system failures actually underlie most errors. Uh, and if you think about the Pareto principle, that would, that would probably apply here as well. Our, um, our focus needs to be on the process of care and not looking for someone to blame. In, a, in an older mindset, uh, you, if you had a bad outcome, you would find out whose fault it was and you would fire them or blame them. And the belief was that uh, that would prevent that bad outcome from ever happening again. Um, the reality is that if you have a system problem, the same problem will occur with a different group of people until you fix the system problem. So questions like, you know, how did this happen or why did this person act this way? Those are more helpful than who's responsible or whose fault is this. And the types of areas you look for when you're doing an RCA or root cause analysis would be things like communication, rigid hierarchies, absence of redundancies, system flaws. And again, and if these systems aren't fixed, then the same system failures occur regardless of who the people are involved. So the example I like to use for system thinkers, uh, system thinking is around a four-year-old spilling milk on the rug. So when a four-year-old has a cup of milk and it spills, there are questions you would ask in a root cause analysis. You would ask who got the milk, who chose the cup, who poured the milk. And as you ask these questions, you're gathering information. Now, how do you organize that information? What you could do is you could have a brainstorming session where you think of all of the variables that are involved in the spilled milk, uh, not judge them, not put them in order, but then when it's time to order them, you, you have these individuals and objects on sticky notes, and you think about how we could group them together. So if we were in manufacturing, we might divide them up along themes that affect manufacturing, that include materials and machines. We're in a service industry in healthcare, so we might look at more policies, procedures, people using five Ps. Uh, but another way, we might choose our own categories. And we might just group them together in ways we think make sense. And it could be objects, or it could be uh, uh, things with m greater than or equal to two legs. And we could just sort them this way. You could see the child, the sibling, the parent, the cow all end up in one box, and the a refrigerator and rug and other objects end up in another. And this is a way to build an affinity diagram, grouping things together. Uh, if you take uh, those categories, you can also build them into a fishbone diagram or an Ishikawa diagram. And this is also cause a, called a cause and effect diagram. And I'll show you an example of one. It's called a fishbone because these uh, oblique lines look like the bones of a fish and the arrowhead is the uh, pointing to the, the outcome ultimately is the head of the fish. So in this particular fishbone diagram, I broke down the spilled milk and identified the different uh, 
governmental process, processes evolved around uh, milk production and transportation and the rules around spills. Uh, I looked at different practices. I looked at different procedures and the people who were involved in the, in the different type of physical plant issues. But in looking at this, as you look at all of these potential drivers, it gives you an opportunity to look at what the major drivers are. And you also have to ask yourself is, was the system actually designed to spill milk? Was, was the system, if the system is allowing milk to be spilled, how can we change that system to get a different outcome? And Paul Batalden says that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the result it achieves. So if you think about the spilled milk, you ended up with milk being able to be spilled because the cup didn't have a cover on it. So going back and looking at your workflow and figuring out how you always end up with a cup and a cover together, uh, one solution that some parents use is they only put the cups and lids on shelves that children can reach. And anytime they want to get a glass of milk, they say, go get a cup and a lid. And now the cup and the lid are together. The milk is poured, the cup gets a lid put on it, and you don't have any spilled milk. You use all the same materials that you had in the beginning, but you order them differently, put them in different places. You remove cups that have no lids from the reach of the children. If we think about trying to do something like this in healthcare, uh, the Institute of Medicine has said that to, in its report to Air is Human, that most errors in healthcare are felt to be system issues and not individual problems. And that means they require system solutions. Another way you might think about root cause analysis or trying to understand when there's special cause variation is to use a tool called the five whys. And you might, in the spilled milk example, ask, you know, why did the milk spill on the floor? Well, it spilled on the floor because uh, there was milk in the cup and there was no lid. Well, why was there no lid? And then you would keep asking and probing until you get down to the fact that the lids are stored in one part of the house and the cups are stored in another part of the house. And your solution then becomes, you know, what can we do to improve um, our, our outcome? What can we do to reduce the number of spilled milks? And you change your process. So if we look at uh, another graphing tool, uh, we can talk about scatter plots and stratification. This is a, just a scatter diagram uh, showing you some data points uh, with time on one axis and uh, data points uh, from number of hours expired elapsed on the next axis. And you look for patterns from a positive correlation where these are tightly clustered together in one direction or a negative correlation, again, where they're tightly clustered together, but in the opposite direction. If you're looking for at stratification, uh, this is a nice illustration from ASQ, uh, you can see a lot of uh, data points on the graph, but you might group them and say that these red, this, uh, these five dots belong in one group, these belong in another group, and this belongs in another cluster. And by stratifying these, you can then look to see what these uh, data points have in common as a way to analyze your data. And that brings us back to the original comment of uh, original talk, opening talk, where we talked about the, you have some data. And how do you connect those dots, what tools you could use? And then how do you analyze and present this data? So if we think about uh, several data points, these are just circles of uh, you know, white background. Um, you could color in the data, you could connect the dots in a variety of ways. And this is just uh, one way to think about connecting uh, dots. Uh, in this uh, uh, tweet from SpecGhost, you have uh, green and purple uh, dots being colored in, uh, calling that knowledge and then connecting them with uh, straight lines. And then if you were really creative, you could see that all along, this was actually a face and that those dots were dots that were represented a, a cat. So in the last uh, minute, I'd like to give you a, a take home final exam. 
I'd like you to think about what you could do, what test you could do uh, in the next week or so, say by next Tuesday. What could you do that would allow you to collect data and identify an area for potential improvement? Because if you don't use these types of tools, then you're not really able to make improvements. And this all starts by asking a question and collecting some data. So I, I thank you for your attention and, and I think we're gonna try and see if there are some questions. Thank you, Dr. Rawson. This was excellent talk and very, very useful uh, for our audience. We do have some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, before we move on to those, uh, I just wanted, I just had a few comments. I thought the root cause analysis, uh, was, which you explained was one of the best explanations of the root cause analysis of blaming uh, not the people, but also thinking more deeply about the process. And I love the example of the child with a milk spill because I'm a mom of a two-year-old, so I could completely understand it very well. Um, and I also feel that many of the programs who have joined us today are first radiology residency programs in the country, like Rwanda, Zambia. And these tools are extremely effective and useful for, uh, for these early programs who are trying to uh, bring value and improve quality. Um, one question I have before I ask the questions from the audience is, what other free resources can our audience use for learning about this topic? I think your talk is excellent. And if people want to go into further detail, I, I know you mentioned Wikipedia for the Nelson rules, um, but any other sources which are free of cost, uh, which uh, radiology residents and radiologists in uh, low and middle income countries can access? I, I think the uh, right now on the internet, there are a number of uh, professional societies that have some of their material presented online, uh, both radiology professional societies and other groups. I, I think uh, depending on what the topic is, you sort of end up looking on different um, websites. Uh, some of the uh, radiology, main radiology societies or the professional uh, subspecialty groups have put a lot of lectures online uh, for medical students and residents. Um, and I think if you go to those, uh, web, their websites, you'll find uh, an education tab with some open access lectures that you can further uh, explore. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for answering the question so well. Uh, we have a question from uh, UC UCST. Can you please comment on diversity within radiology and healthcare more generally? And what steps you see as critical in moving the system towards a more equitable and true representation of the society? That's a big question for a relatively <laughs> short period of time. Um, a separate I, topic, I guess, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that uh, part of what you have to look at is um, building uh, pipeline relationships with the multiple different groups within our population and in the communities that we serve to be able to have students earlier in uh, their lives and their careers be able to not only get interested in medicine and radiology, but also to be able to support them through that journey so they get to the point where they are applicants to radiology residencies. Um, I think that that type of uh, building a, a pipeline, building uh, nurturing environments, recruiting people and helping provide the mentorship and sponsorship to get through that process, not only to get to the residency, but also then to continue the training and then go into practice as necessary. And some of those pieces exist, but they don't exist everywhere and they're not, uh, they don't uh, uniformly recruit and develop from all of the different populations that we serve. Right, excellent. Uh, we have a comment, congratulations, excellent information from Dr. Enrique Menero from Mexico. Uh, we have a question. I think again, that's a broad question. And um, uh, while the, with the upcoming election, could you comment on the role of, of health services research in optimizing or guiding health policy changes to improve the delivery of healthcare? Well, I think one of the challenges you find when you talk about improving healthcare is not everybody has the same metric uh, that they're going to use to determine that there's been an improvement. So much like the tools we talked about today, you, you start to ask about what it is you're gonna use as your measurement. So if we talk about um, access to healthcare, 
perhaps the number of people who are insured or the percentage of the country that is uninsured would be one metric to measure whether we have made significant improve, improvement in the delivery of care. But if you have healthcare insurance, um, you may find yourself living in an area that does not have uh, either the, the skills that you need or uh, doesn't have them in sufficient numbers. So you may not have convenient access. It, it may be a long trip or it may be that it's a three month wait before you can get care. So some people would look at the access uh, to care as part of the improvement that needs to occur. Others might look at uh, as, an, uh, as an outcome measurement, um, either survival or improved uh, health outcomes that would be measured in some specific ways. So I think for health services research, there's no lack of opportunity to try and uh, determine what metrics to use to measure the improvement of delivery of care. Uh, but there's a lot of metrics you could use and probably no one metric is the, is the absolute right one. So the challenge becomes determining which metrics you're gonna try and optimize and then what improvement interventions you wanna put in place and how to do, make the, uh, the policy changes and the practice changes to accomplish that. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, let me just see, there are lots of good comments and thank you. So I'm just going to go down the list. Uh, we have, um, thank you from uh, uh, Dr. Falavio Ernesto Trujillo from Mexico, uh, Ivan Rukundo uh, from Rwanda, uh, Joseph Muzambiana from University of Rwanda, the first residency program there. Uh, again, a great talk from Betsada Sanchez in Mexico, um, Dr. Willie Miller in Canada, uh, from Canada says thank you. Juan Ovale from Colombia, thank you so much for the excellent lecture. Uh, Dr. Raj Shekhar from India, excellent webinar, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Aditi Charusia from India, uh, thank you, a great lecture. Uh, Dr. Shami Malik from Kenya, let's see, uh, um, he said collecting data and tools it has opened an avenue of examining data and outcomes. I think that's a nice comment um, about collecting data. Let me see, Dr. Rawson, if there are any other questions here. I don't think I see any more. There are lots of good talks <laughs> and compliments uh -huh. popping up. We have uh, Dr. Desham, who was one of the first radiologists in Bhutan, who's saying a great talk. And uh, let's see. Dr. Helen Mashimbia, thanks for the great presentation. Dr. Kleenam Zefi Teti, who's the chair of radiology at um, in Ghana at Kolibu Teaching Hospital, uh, is also saying thank you so much. Uh, Fahad Haroon, uh, Dr. Fahad Haroon is saying excellent talk, very informative. Thank you. We have um, a, a, a very nice comment from Nigeria. Good day. I'm Dr. Akinta Mode from Nigeria. Thank you, Dr. Rawson, for an excellent presentation. You have greatly simplified how to use the t tools that improve healthcare. Uh, so, um, Hani, uh, maybe yes. we have a couple of more questions in the QA box. Oh yeah, I think there's one, there's one more which popped up. Thank you so much, Shama. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what, if, uh, what is the next step forward if you find the cause example using root an analysis, but still there is repetition of the problem due to new staff rotating? So what you're, you're, I think what the question is asking is if you put an intervention in place, um, how, does, how do you know that that intervention stays in place? Uh, and that's a, a different topic. That's really the topic of change management. How do you put a change in place and, and make sure that it stays there? Uh, and some of that is having the checks and balances um, so that it can be monitored and you detect when things start to drift back to the old way earlier rather than when it's completely fallen apart. Um, but another is also to think about the way you orient uh, and train people. So if the expectation is that everybody will use this new approach and you have new people rotating through every month or every four months, then the question becomes, how do you orient them so they know that that's the expectation? Do you have a, a, a handout or a standard email with instructions? Do you provide them some a lecture or some video training that lets them know that this is the technique you want them to use and, and why and what the improvement has been from that. 
So I think there has to be some organized uh, monitoring and maintenance uh, to keep the improvements that you get. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Rossum. And we have one more question uh, from Dr. Sanchez. How do you make the patient registration more effective when you have so many patients and so many people responsible for the registration? So the question of how you make registration more effective when you have large numbers of people to register, uh, part of it is, is, again, to look at Deming's approach and, and try and flowchart the process. Uh, some people, once they have the flowchart of the current process, would look at steps and say, are any of those steps not providing value and could they be eliminated? Another approach might be to look at the, the process, look at the steps you're doing and figure out how many of those have to be, how much of that registration process has to be done on site and how, mo how much of it could be done before the patient arrives and try and break it into two different groups. Uh, some people might look at the registration process and decide um, that some of this uh, is something the patient may want control over. And so they may want to create an online uh, opportunity for patients to do the registration themselves. And when they come in, they're completely registered. Uh, and while some of this sounds a little um, uh, sort of IT driven or, or may require more sophisticated tools, um, there are phone apps now that will do scheduling functions for you and that patients are able to, or patients or other services are able to use. Um, there are people who provide services that are strictly scheduled through online uh, services uh, like barbers or hair salons. Right, right. And actually, that, that's a great point, Dr. Rossin, because uh, many of our, our physicians are struggling with high volumes because of COVID-19. Um, and um, uh, so they are having problems with the registration. And I think that is why uh, the question came up, because many of the radiologists are also frontline now. Um, for taking care of COVID-19 patients. Uh, that, and that's a, an excellent point about the apps, even if the IT support does not exist. I think that's excellent. Um, um, and Shama, uh, Jinka, and Mike, any other questions which have come up which I have missed? I guess we have already answered this, but uh, I would like to bring it to your attention. Which are the main tools do you recommend to use? So the question is, uh, what's the main tool that I recommend you use? And I actually don't recommend any one specific tool. I think what you want to do is try and match the tool to the problem you're trying to solve. And the, uh, the analogy I would give you is if you've ever tried to uh, hammer a nail in, but you don't have a hammer, uh, you may have found something else that wasn't a hammer, like a rock or a screwdriver, and eventually gotten that nail in. Um, but it wasn't easy, and you might have hurt yourself in the process, and you probably bent the nail a bit. Um, and if you had that hammer, which was the right tool, it would have been a lot easier to do. If you take that same analogy one step further, and you say instead of a, a nail, it was a screw, if you didn't have a screwdriver and you tried to put that screw in with a coin or a pocket knife or some other straight edge, um, it may take you a lot longer. Um, you can put a screw in with a pair of pliers. Um, it takes you a lot longer and you may never get that screw out. Um, and you probably will hurt yourself as well. Um, so think about matching the tool to the problem you're trying to solve, although you may be able to get the right answer and, and still get it done with another tool, just with a lot more work. 